This feast is our feast insofar as we think of our brethren and sisters who have marched before us using the same means that we have, just having used a much different point in time, that's all, but they're there. And remember, I'm actually hearing this way back in chapter in France. It was the prior, in the absence of the abbot, who was actually giving a conference on the death of one of our brethren, one of the old lay brothers who still wore brown, and he had died like that, a very holy man. And the prior just said this in a few thoughts. Uh, La vraie trappe est au ciel, the true trap is in heaven. That is to say, the great majority were there. No, and we were only a small part of the family. Yeah. It isn't the same family. Yeah. And in fact, that was something which, coming from him, was kind of powerful because he was the world expert on La Ville Rancée, who had reformed, reformed La Trappe way back in the 1600s, but at the same time as you were being founded. Yes. And um, uh, it was a great moment of renewal in, in, in France with these foundations coming. But you see, that community had not stopped. Mm. It had gone into exile, but it had never stopped. And there was a feeling that we were part of a great family. Yeah. And you felt it there, mm. the bricks and the spirituality coming through, particularly Don Lucien, who was the prior, who had studied all the works of this great, hidden, never canonized saint, but somebody who was able to attract by his austerity and coherence, but also by his goodness, because even though he was so austere, he did love his monks, and his monks love him, yes. and that's the, um, the way it should be, that there should be a charism, yes. and it's, that is your spirit as well, that uh, these two actually did attract by their gravitational force of love and charity, because the spirit of Saint François de Sales in particular is not that of any kind of harshness that comes through in all his writings, he attracts by his goodness, and that's the best advertisement. Now in that context, let's look at one or two verses here in Saint John. Because remember that that is the testament the Lord gave us, his parting words, that we should love one another. But it's also quite demanding in so far as he goes into specific areas, the Lord himself. Whoever holds my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Therefore, obedience in practice is important. And that, by the way, is something rather sad when we look at now what we are doing in this kind of mini retreat up to your renewal of vows, it's that that can actually happen, that in the interests of keeping vows, keeping in particular les us, we should say in France, the usages, that is, certain customs, certain ways of doing things, that charity can go through the window, it can even happen actually at the altar, that people, orders or whatever, are keen on perfection and so on, can actually look at that perfection and bypass charity. Mm. And that can get out of proportion. It can happen. Now, I shall love him and reveal myself to him. I remember actually being asked this one time by one of our brethren, who wanted to know the Greek behind this, what is that word, manifest myself to him? What is the Lord actually saying here? And it is a good question. Is it not true that when we are before him in a state of grace, looking at him or being just with him, there where the Blessed Sacrament is, we do, after a while, by a process of osmosis, pick up what he's thinking, so to speak. We get his mind, the mind of Christ. No words, just the intuition. That's how he sees it. And that, by the way, is the way to solve the problem. Not mathematically, but when there's discernment to be done, expose yourself to him and let him give him your thought. And peacefully you will discern, because he's getting through to you. Now, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, and that, by the way, is interesting. You've got these two with the same name, and both go in two separate ways into the beyond. Said to him, Lord, what has happened that you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And then the Lord goes on, anyone who loves me will keep my word. Again, this question of coherence. And my father will love him and we shall come to him. Now that is the essence of the purely contemplative life, that we are mansions. That word comes from manual to dwell. We are indwelt. We are as much tabernacles as the tabernacle in the chapel. And that is 
essentially the contemplative life. All the Lord wants us to do is to give him rest. Let him find rest in our breast all the time. We are living tabernacles and he wants us to be pure beings of love. Therefore be careful because that is one of the great plagues of the contemplative life. That we're so busy that we miss the point. And it can happen. I've seen it happen. I think I mentioned this to you before one time. We had this letter from the Abbot General that he was a monk actually from the English monastery of Mont Saint Bernard, Mont Saint Bernard, uh, Ambrose Southie. I think he's still alive actually. And he came out with this in a letter how it's so sad that there are so few contemplatives in the order. We had it in French, si peu de contemplatif dans l'ordre. In other words, that especially for the men, it works perfectly as a great machine. It's economically viable, but look at the instincts. Do they actually drift towards the tabernacle in the free moments or towards the newspapers, etc., etc.? Mm -hmm. But you see, these are little tests they indicate. And with regard to that, there are other tests too. And Paul VI actually mentioned this way back. Uh, uh, it, it was a warning that he was trying to give to the contemplatives that if something happens in one place, it's not necessarily the signal it must happen elsewhere as well. Because he could see that what's happening, it was happening in the years after the council, that there were things of the order of the essence, not just les usages, but of the essence which were going out of the window. And one particular question, he, was, he didn't say so, but obviously he had his hand on it, it was the question of the communication with the outside world. Because, now you look, in a monastery, or for that matter in a hermitage, or in a family, it's not indifferent who you invite into the hearth of your family. If you have children, for instance, it's not indifferent if you invite people who have bad language, who smoke and so on, in the presence of the children. They are presences which affect the presences and actually harm the souls of little ones and our own as well. Now, transport that to a monastic setting. You can do that virtually. You can do it by enthroning the television in the chapter room or the equivalent and putting it on without controlling what's going to be on. It's not indifferent because what's actually happening there is that you're inviting the virtual presences of that box to come into the hearth of your community. And it's not indifference as regards its consequences, because there you're going to get messages from souls not in a state of grace. Therefore, what will you expect? Now, it's quite different from inviting somebody who's living a life of prayer to be invited to come and speak to your community, to share whatever it might be in your community. There, you're actually sharing that divine life. The television is plugged into satanic forces also. Therefore, it's a warm invitation, yes, let's say it, to Satan to have a share in your life. Now, be careful. I'm talking about live television. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to recorded things, e.g., some DVD which somebody gives you, this is worth watching, watch it, that's quite different. It's like a book. You're selecting and you know exactly what's coming and there aren't any advertisements in between. But it's quite different plugging into live television where you don't know in advance what's going to happen from one second to another. And monastic situations are even more fragile and vulnerable on that one. Why? Because we're not used to the shocks. We're not used to the stuff. Outside they are. It's like water over a duck's back. It's not the same for us at all. And it can have great damaging effects on our imagination once they come in. They don't stay away uh, once they're in. They're in there and able to wreak havoc in the future. So that's something I'm throwing out to you, because it's not indifferent, but it's damaged considerably the monastic life all over the place. Mm. I know that in Ross Cray to this day, uh, um, uh, they've refused to have television. They will never have, they do not, all the abbots since Tom Columbia and my new way back in the 80s, they've always refused television, because they know that if they bring it into the house, it will not be the same afterwards. Right. It's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Lord goes on here, and the word that you hear is not my own. It is the word of the Father who sent me. Now, uh, I'm bringing this in for this reason, that I want to, in these three lectures, speak briefly about the year of faith, because it's precisely 
something which providence is giving us as a powerful ear of meditation together with a whole mystical body on our faith, therefore the word. And it's not our word. Now, this question of the supernatural vision of things is important. Faith is a divine gift. It's not just a calculation of mind, that's reason. There is a leap and a light which comes from on high. And observe what is going on now in dialogue. People are coming away from that to the realm of opinion, argument and reason, even actually among the clergy quite often. There's a certain independence of view, even in writing, and it's causing confusion. And once we get to that level, you look at now what's going on with regard to these priests who have been asked not to uh, say certain things or write certain things, or if they do, they're not speaking on behalf of the church, they're doing their own thing. The reaction that the media has tried to enforce with regard to that, but well, what's going on there? It's back to that notion of each one thinking his own thing and having an opinion and having freedom to express it. Well, it's basically a Protestantism. It's a neo-Protestantism which is in the air and it's around. And when priests are giving their own thing, even in the pulpit, it's a form of Protestantism because we're not in charge of the truth. The truth judges us. The truth is the Logos. The truth cannot change. It is not our word, as the Lord is saying here. It is the Father's word and we must be subservient to it. It's the supernatural vision that we adore, obey and are judged by this word. We do not in any way form or change it. And therefore it's important to be aware of this. Why the Holy Father has reserved this third one of the trilogy, because he gave, first of all, remember, Deus Caritas Est, the, the work, first encyclical was on charity, then we had hope. Now he's kept this one, he's going into faith as the crunch, because he sees this is the area right now in the church of very severe illness, and he knows where he's coming from. He was in charge of and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, so exactly knows uh, the overview of things and how we stand. And this country is unfortunately a prime example, because that is precisely, and it's been picked up in the Apostolic Visitation, the serious crisis in Ireland is linked with a total lack of serious catechesis. It's everywhere. You'll ask the children what they believe in, it's very, very nebulous. And it's down, unfortunately, in the documents they're studying, a live oath, it's very, very, very watered down. And that's the Church of Tomorrow. So. From every level, it's the same thing. And you ask people who have been studying in some of the places of theology and so on in Ireland, it's the same thing there. Modernism coming in, so it's that's the formation they're getting and they're going to give to others down the line. So just be aware, it's not just human. There's an attack, an attack going on from within. Now just be aware of that, because it's not indifferent what's going on, because that's, that attack is going to have a very damaging effect on the generations yet to come, because who's going to hand on the faith to them? The parents aren't, the school teachers aren't anymore, it's not like the nuns before. It's very, very watered down, so it's going to lead to this degradation of the faith. Now, with regard to that, what are therefore the points of reference? I mentioned that there's this question of personal interpretation going on. Well, you don't lay that down as the point of reference. If you hear something fishy, what do you do? You go to the sources. What are the sources? Well, here they are. And they're the ones precisely the Holy Father is asking us to look into. It. First of all, the documents of Vatican II itself. I've got a little slim volume there in, it, in Italian, but it's, it's a useful thing to have in the house close to you and to pick it up now and again, because after all, our faith is there. Now, it doesn't stop there. The footnotes are important as well, because the footnotes indicate where they're referring to. Therefore, it gives you all the references, and it refers very often to the Council of Trent. It's bound to the, 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 pre, the previous councils. And therefore, remember, these points are sure. Now, <coughs> then we have the Catechism. We have in between those, of course, the Co Code of Canon Law, which is a juridical document, but written in such a way that it's no longer a dry juridical document alone. It's also a very spiritual document, especially in the part that speaks of the sanctifying office of the Church. Parts which can be read in a supernatural way, actually quite well put together. The, the last part is more juridical and so on, but there's a lot of very spiritual things in the way it's put together. Even in its law, the Church is trying to invite us to a higher vision of things. But this, then, is for all. It came 20 years after the Council, and 30 years from now, isn't it? It's 1992 it's published, the Catechism, so it's also 
uh, it was the very day, I think, that the council had finished, wasn't it? The same as the year of faith when that started. So here we are. Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Again, what do we have in here? We have the structure, which is something similar to the structure of the other catechisms all along. You've got the going into the faith and so on, uh, the articles of the creed, but you've got the commandments and so on. If you've got the whole thing analytically put together, therefore you can go to what you're looking for. In a library, you have to know how to handle the resources, the source material. And the same if you're in a seminary or doing any course, the secret is knowing how to handle the sources. You just know how to navigate. Mm -hmm. You go for what you're looking for. And of course, the secret is go to the index. If you're looking for go to the index, and that'll point you out. And then you've got your thing. Then you've got, in your article, you've got the footnotes. Now, the footnotes are bound to refer to EG, because it's after this one. It's going to refer to Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council. And it also will refer to the catechism which was in force after the Council of Trent, which was a good, succinct document. Um, the answers and so on were very clear, and it was basically that that was being, in a simple form, given to children over the years, wasn't it? It's what you would have known when you were children. You're your generation anyway, you'd had that form of catechism. But anyway, the point is this. The fact that this is always referring to earlier ones, and in particular to the Council of Trent, is significant. By that very fact, it's indicating the Church is not in command of its truth. There are certain points where that truth is safeguarded. It is declared to be present, and when you have in a dogmatic council, the Council of Trent is a dogmatic council, a canon, that is an article at the end of a treatise, you have this canon. If so-and-so says such-and-such, let him be anathema. That's how it's yes. put. It's a, six, it's, a, it's a formula which is quite brief, and it contains in that sentence the parameters of the truth. You know that the truth is there. It's not the last word on the truth. It's not all that can be said on the truth, but that phrase is true. And if you deny it, then you're outside the teaching body of the church. You're doing your own thing. So that can't change, because that is claiming the promise of the Lord that he will send the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. Therefore, when the church, all the bishops together, in union with Peter, does pronounce something of that nature with an anathema at the end of it, that is guaranteed. Therefore, these are solid points. It's not your father down the road, whoever it might be, anywhere in the church who's saying his own thing. It's these points where the Holy Spirit is speaking. So listen and be calm with regard to where you disprove or argue something. It's not your problem. The Lord has shown, and he's showing to us as Catholics, where the truth is. So there's just a question of knowing how to handle source material. That, by the way, brings us to another point. It's the question of the nature of the church itself. Now, the Council of Trent was, remember, a providential moment of history brought about by what was happening at that point, the Protestant Revolution that was God good part of Europe was falling apart, basically, because it was linked with political power. But when you had a local lord who went that way, he had also the power to make his people go with him. Cus regio, eus religio. Whose region, his religion. That's what it used to work. And therefore, as a potentate of the area, who became Protestant, and all his flock went with him. That's how Luther was so successful. He had the secular arm on his side in some parts, and the same in Geneva with regard to Calvin. Now, therefore, what happened at Trent was a providential moment of getting down to exactly analysing what were the parameters of truth, because all these opinions were around, but it had to be said, OK, if you don't say this, you are no longer in the mystical body as we know it. You're doing your own thing. But there's another problem. It's this. The Catholic Church is able to do that. Why? It is able to claim that promise of the Holy Spirit when, therefore, all the bishops in union with Peter proclaim. Then we have this guarantee. Now, things coming out of the Catholic Church, new ecclesial bodies and communions, like what happened in England, which kept a certain structure on the outside, can they be called churches? Now, glibly and loosely, people talk about the, the Anglican Church, but you notice all the Vatican documents, and anything coming from Peter, never ever uses the term Anglican Church. They always make the distinction the Anglican Communion. 
Now, there's a reason for that. Going back now to 1054, you remember what happened then? Until then, the church was, as John Paul II would have put it, breathing with its two lungs, east and west. Yes. They had gone their own way in observances. They were allowing people on the parish level who were married to become priests, but of course they wouldn't become bishops. Therefore, all the bishops in the east tended to be from the monastic world, and it's still the case, actually. Mm. And they would have the use of icons, two-dimensional but never three-dimensional, therefore there was a different way of doing things. They would have the Mass once a week, or at the most twice if it was a big feast, but only once, not the daily one, because it was always sung with incense and chant and all the rest of it, lasting two or three hours, about three actually. Therefore a different way of doing things, the priests always having a beard, they never shave, going back to the Old Testament, but different ways of doing things, and so sort of never shave even their head. They're, they're the same with the hair, always it grows. They don't cut their hair in the East, the, the priest. Is different. You know, the culture is different, mm. and therefore no, not, not using organ either in church, different area. They're still the same case, they don't use organ. In the Greek church, they, they don't use polyphony either, but in the Russian church, they do polyphony. But anyway, a different feel, if you like, but nevertheless, the same sacramental life, flowing freely in the East and in the West, with a difference in the East, they don't receive Holy Communion very often, a uh, minimum of once a year, but quite often the people themselves not do more than once a year. They might go a bit more if they're very pious, but they have to have the priest's permission and blessing every time. He knows exactly who's going to go to Communion first before the Mass, not like in the, in the West at all. Um, but a different ethos, but that's on the level of observances. But the point is, they had the same divine life coming from the upper room. And the proof that the Lord is very much working in them is the number of saints they've had in places like Russia, in great persecution and even earlier. The monastic life has been very strong in Russia, and great mystics there, very austere and so on. But also the fact that it's in the hands of the Greek patriarch of Jerusalem that the Easter miracle takes place every year. When we were talking about one time with you here, how uh, on Holy Saturday we have this miraculous fire, but it has to happen always in the successor of the Bishop of Jerusalem, the first one, which is James. Uh, therefore, it happens always in the same man's hand, that is, Bishop the Patriarch of Jerusalem, who is therefore an Orthodox. And that's it. The Lord, therefore, is very much working in the Eastern Orthodox Church to this day, and they have great reverence, and the Spirit is very much alive in them, and they have a lot to teach us. But, and it's an important but, even though we can therefore call them fully churches, why? Whereas we can't call the Anglican Church a church, in that technical theological sense, the reason is that they have what? The Apostolic Succession. Now, do you see the big difference? Yeah. That makes them a church. Mm -hmm. it, going back to the apostles, the apostles and the autocephalous church, kephalos in Greek is a head. Autocephalous church, they have their own head. A patriarch is head of his own church. We have the patriarch of the West in their vision. They have uh, Peter, they would regard as the first uh, in honor traditionally, um, and therefore he would be there. And they recognize that still. They haven't put another one in his place. He's there, you see. Um, but. Uh, Nevertheless, there are the other patriarchates which we can't ignore. Now, of course, it's the vision of John Paul II and the present Pope is in the same line. They want to try and get the church to breathe again with its two lungs. But the problem actually is on their side, not ours. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to dialogue with certain ones, especially of a certain type, Mount Athos and so on. They're, they're, they're very difficult to dialogue with. Mm -hmm. So it's not our problem, really. Anyway, it's another story. Now, what I'm getting at is this. Therefore, we have to understand, they have the divine life, the sacramental life, and are fully churches. And the way that the present Pope speaks about them and to them is very respectful. He knows the reverend, the reverence is due to these our elder brethren, in a sense, who have not changed. That's the point. They have not changed. Now, that's what's happened. They are as they were in 1054, and they are fossilized at that point, and they cannot, as we can, have the organism of self-understanding under the guarantee of the Holy Spirit in the same way. Why? Peter is missing. Therefore, they can never have an ecumenical council. The word ecumenical means belonging to the inhabited world. Oikos, house, and oikomeni is the inhabited part of the world. Therefore, the whole world. They cannot have an ecumenical council. They have the early ones, all seven, which we have two, but then it stops. They can't have trends and so on. They tried, actually, in 14... 39 to have the Florence Council there. The Council of Florence was an ecumenical council and it did try to patch up the two and for a while, a short while, they were actually again the two, the East and the West. But what happened again? When the Eastern Fathers went back, they found that the people rejected, they would not accept. 
partly because of historical memories, because you know what happened during the time of the Crusades and so on. The Crusaders went over and they bashed the brains out of people of the Eastern Church in Constantinople. That was a big mistake. I mean, they never forgot that, and other things as well. Um, but anyway, another story of that. So there we are. Just to be clear what's going on. Therefore, we have in the West what they can never have in the East, this kind of continued documentation and self-understanding of the Church, which is precious. The life of the Catholic Church, therefore, is bound to be more dynamic, isn't it? It's bound to be always adjourned. It's bound to be uh, on the level of what's going on outside. Whereas, in fact, in practice, in the Eastern Church, it's very interesting, because it's as it was, but it's very difficult then to fit that into modern terms as regards the life of the church as the Catholic Church is very able to. It addresses every issue as it comes and adapts itself very well yes. to new situations. So that's the Holy Spirit. With all, of course, the B side of that. It depends what? On our maturity. And if we haven't got maturity, things are bound to go wrong. And that's precisely what happened after Vatican II. The Council Fathers were presuming that there would be human maturity, that we would be adults to use well the new openness and number of choices that we would have. In practice, it led to quite the opposite. It led to laziness and irresponsibility. And that's what we're at still. So true renewal has to be in that linear movement of re-linking up with where we've come from and being mature in applying the life which is potentially there in the generation that we're living post-Vatican II. Now, I want to finish with <clears throat> a reference to this feast day that we're celebrating. Uh, All Saints Day <clears throat> puts us precisely in the succession of another sort, the succession of those who have handled grace, the same grace coming from the upper room, coming through the sacraments, which has brought them to glory, the other side where they're waiting for us to come and join them. As I was saying, the Vretra, the, uh, the true trap is on the other side, waiting for us to come and join them. Now, that was something that was brought home to me very strongly when I was a young man. I may have mentioned to you before that I was in a parish as I was growing up, belonging to the English Benedictines, because they had lots of parishes around Britain in those days. They've brought back a few of these now and given them over to the, the secular priesthood, but they had quite a few, including a big one when I was growing up in Cardiff. There were six or seven monks there and it was linked to ample force. And we would dis I would listen to what they were saying, they were instructing me and so on, and I would get to know a few of their monasteries here and there. And I got to know, as well as ample force itself, slightly downside and Ealing. <coughs> and I remember uh, Ealing's downside of, uh, is, a, is a daughter house of downside. Ealing's one of the daughter houses of downside. And there, uh, they were talking about things within the family. And you'll see what I'm getting at now in a second, the family. Now remember that these families, like La Trappe in France, go right back. The Benedictines in England are the venerable English Benedictine congregation. Why venerable? It's one of the most ancient. They go right back through one man. Mm. One man. It's Tom Sidgwick Butley who handed on the habit and the succession to two young novices. He was from Western Canada. <coughs> <coughs> Benedictines had to go into exile. They went to different places on the continent. They went to Genoir, they went to Douai, they went to Paris. And in Genoir they carried on, but also in places like Valladolid and Douai, there was the family which became downside carrying on in parallel. Now, these families, therefore, lived through all these persecutions. Remember, there's an unbroken link. And you talk to any of these monks who are from these big monasteries in England, and actually the nuns of Stanbrook were in the same succession, and you will find that they have stories within the family. Oh, yeah. And it's very interesting, because you feel this is living history. Yes, yes. And if you like, I'll just tell you one story to give you uh, some taste of the kind of things that you'll be aware of. Remembering that in places like Downside, you've got big relics of people who were badly tortured and treated, Tyburn and so on. It's the same family. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Then I shall begin. I'll give you just one story from inside the family. Now, one day, we were young men standing, sitting around in Chapter House, 
And one of the monks told us this story. Ah, very interesting. Mm. This happened in, uh, he told us where it happened, it wasn't supposed to be known, but it's true. It happened in Downside. And this young monk, no, actually he was a priest, a secular priest, he'd just been ordained. It was Christmas time and he wanted to spend his first Christmas in retreat. And he went to Downside Abbey. So, now in those days before the council, every priest would celebrate on his own. It wasn't consideration as we know it. And also he would celebrate not once but three times at Christmas. And in those days, one after the other. So anyway, it's a big monastery downside. And so he went to the sacristan and asked if he could celebrate. Well, 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 50, please don't say 50, I'm fine, well, so anyway, he rummaged around, you see, he rummaged around for um, a chalice and an altar. So anyway, his little chalice, he got this little chalice, a tiny, tiny chalice. He used this, okay, oh, perfect, off he went, you see, with this chalice, tiny one. So anyway, celebrating on his own there, you see. And then, using great devotion, it was his first Christmas after ordination. And then, as he was going along on his own there at the altar, he started hearing, hearing noises. Noises and noises. Mm. 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 You can't stop what you started, he's carrying on. So anyway, his noises got louder. That's going on. Anyway, he carried on, you see, he carried on. So anyway, he couldn't stop. So anyway, mm. so he got to the offertory and they were getting very loud, you see, there were people approaching, cries and grunting, what's going on, you see. So anyway, he carried on. You know, so anyway, he got to the, the elevation, it was an almighty noise, and eventually he got to the annual stay and boom. <coughs> silence. Anyway, he carried on. Then he did the second one and the third one, and then got to bed. And uh, anyway, the following morning he came along, you see, in the sacristan. Well, oh, Father, how did you get on last night? It was an experience. Ah, oh, yes, well, actually, I didn't have time to explain, Father, you see, the, mm, so he knew a bit more. Mm. Yes, the chalice I gave you, you see, there's a story behind that. Oh, yes, well, tell me about it, yeah, well, it's like this, really. Mm -hmm. You see, this is what we refer to as the persecution chalice. You saw its size, it was only tiny, well, there's a reason for that. That was used by our fathers when they couldn't have the sacred mysteries easily. Even in prison it was used, and it was used actually during the terror in France. And it was used by a young priest who had just been ordained. And they got the chalice to him so he could celebrate mass before he was guillotined. And there he was in London, no, in Paris. And they were coming along and it was Christmas. And he was celebrating in secret with this tiny chalice in the prison cell. He had just the minimum. And as he was doing so, someone was being carried out to be guillotined. And he was passing this cell as he was celebrating. And he was guillotined just as he was celebrating and getting to the annual stay. And it is said that every time a young priest celebrates his first Christmas mass with his chalice, he hears it. And the monk who was telling us this, he then looked around at us, using my round about on his head, looking in my direction. Mm, I haven't yet found anyone who has been able to try it out. <laughs>